Sup Chooms, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. So, one of the reasons I do what I do on this channel is because there is just so much medical misinformation on the internet about DHT. I've repeatedly gone over why DHT is not an important hormone in adulthood, and every time I demonstrate this, what will happen is the goalpost will shift away from DHT and towards the enzyme that is responsible for the creation of DHT, 5AR. 5AR cells will usually say something like, yeah, maybe DHT isn't that important, but the problem is, is that finasteride suppresses 5AR, and 5AR is needed for many important physiological functions in the body. Didn't you know that, Kevin? People will say this like it is some sort of rhetorical kryptonite, like, yeah, checkmate, finasteride apologist. As it turns out, though, the misinformation and lies aren't just about DHT, but they're also about the different alpha reductase isoenzymes that we lump together and call the 5AR enzyme. There is almost as much BS about 5AR as there is about DHT, which is saying quite a lot, because DHT has literal online cults that worship it as some sort of sacred hormone, which is patently ridiculous. The truth is, though, is that a lot of the hype about 5AR overlaps hype about DHT, and you usually see the same garbage spewed from the same online communities who will make exaggerated or misguided claims about what functions 5AR has in the body, what tissues contain 5AR, and how finance and dutasteride compare in blocking the different forms of the 5AR enzyme. Whenever I use evidence-based research to show why blocking the type 1 and type 2 5AR isoenzymes with drugs doesn't cause all the problems that people claim it does, these finasteride and dutasteride haters will pull out the type 3 isoenzyme as their trump card and say, but Kevin, what about the type 3 isoenzyme? You are totally ignoring a major 5AR isoenzyme. Why is that, bro? Well, what is it about this mysterious type 3 5AR isoenzyme that everybody has been hyping up recently? What does it do, and what effect do finasteride and dutasteride have on it exactly? Do the 5AR simps maybe have a point here? Well, buckle up hair loss switchers because we are about to invest heavily into the alchemy build to give you a balls deep dive into the 5AR isoenzymes, and I bet you'll find that after watching this video, a lot of misconceptions about these isoenzymes will be cleared up. So first of all, let's clear up the terminology here and talk about what enzymes do. Enzymes, what they do is they facilitate chemical reactions in the cells, and there are literally thousands of different types of enzymes in the human body. Enzymes can take two molecules and combine them into one, or they can break apart one molecule into two molecules. Enzymes can also just modify a molecule, and that is what the 5AR enzyme does. For example, it could take a testosterone molecule and make a small change to it, turning it into DHT. In this figure, you can see that the only change that 5AR makes to turn testosterone into dihydrotestosterone, or DHT, is this double line here called a double bond, which is reduced to a single line, which is a single bond, and a hydrogen atom is added. So that simple change converts the alpha chad hormone testosterone into the beta virgin bitch trash hormone DHT, which is the hormone responsible for us losing our hair, amongst many other horrible things, of course. Sure, DHT does have important roles in utero and early adolescent development, but in adulthood, it only serves to cause trouble for us, like hair loss, acne, and an enlarged prostate, and I've made a series of videos on why DHT is a trash hormone, and I'll link them all below in case you haven't seen them yet. So is 5AR a completely trash enzyme because it creates this horrible, useless hormone DHT? Well, strictly speaking, no, not really. First, because like I said, DHT is important before we reach adulthood, and also because the 5AR enzyme acts on other molecules besides testosterone. The 5AR enzyme is one of the enzymes involved in the synthesis of neurosteroids, but misconceptions about how these neurosteroids are created and what effect finasteride and dutasteride have on their synthesis has created a lot of fear-mongering about these drugs, which I've addressed in several videos, which I'll also link below. So, to put it simply, 5AR is not a trash enzyme. If you were to remove 100% of the 5AR enzyme from the body, it would certainly cause problems. But in the context of how 5AR inhibitors like finasteride and dutasteride influence the 5AR enzymes, there is no cause for concern whatsoever. To understand all this better, though, we have to introduce the concept of what's called isoenzymes, also known as isoforms of enzymes. Many people, including myself sometimes, have used the terms enzyme and isoenzyme interchangeably, and that is because of a fairly common misconception about isoenzymes which is that they are just minor variations of an enzyme that give the enzyme slightly different properties. But that actually isn't true. 
Isoenzymes are enzymes that have similar functions, but they don't have the same structure. In fact, their structures don't even have to be similar at all. Originally, there were two 5-AR isoenzymes identified, but now there are actually five, which include 5-AR type 1, type 2, type 3, as well as two even more obscure isoenzymes called glycoprotein synaptic 2, or GPSN2, and glycoprotein synaptic 2-like proteins, or GPSN2L. There really isn't much known about these last two enzymes, which to make everything more confusing, have other names like TECR or TECRL. So in a sense, you can think of the 5-AR enzymes as parallels to the five wizards from the Lord of the Rings series. Everybody knows about Gandalf the Grey and Sauron the White. That's no mystery. So they can be seen as the type 1 and type 2 5-AR isoenzymes. Radagast the Brown Wizard, on the other hand, isn't as well known as he was only briefly mentioned by J.R.R. Tolkien, but was added into the shitty Hobbit movies, which themselves were a vast embellishment of the humble children's novel written by Tolkien and published in 1939. So Radagast the Brown can be seen as the type 3 5-AR isoenzyme. Even more obscure than that, though, are the two blue wizards who were briefly mentioned but never described except very briefly in the Silmarillion, which makes them the most obscure of the five AR enzyme wizards, although maybe we'll learn more about them in the next season of the Rings of Power if you can stomach that show. The blue wizards would be GPSN2 and GPSN2L. You know what? <laughs> this is a pretty stupid analogy. I'm sorry. Okay, let's get serious here. Anyways... The 5AR type 1, 2, and 3 isoenzymes are very different in structure to each other. Type 1 and 2 are the most similar, sharing 47% of their amino acid sequence, but the type 3 isoenzyme is quite different from the first two. It shares only about 20% of its amino acid sequence with the type 1 and type 2 isoenzymes. I also originally thought that the three isoenzymes probably came from the same chromosome, but the DNA code for each of the three is located on three different chromosomes. So these isoenzymes are really quite different, especially the type 3 isoenzyme, which is far more enigmatic and mysterious than the first two. These three isoenzymes are located in different tissues and have different functions in the body. The type 1 and type 2 5-AR isoenzymes are the most familiar. The type 2 isoenzyme is the most notorious to hair loss sufferers because it is found in the hair follicles and is by far the most important isoenzyme in causing androgenic alopecia. It is also the predominant isoenzyme in the prostate, causing benign prostatic hyperplasia in older men, which makes it harder for them to pee. The type 1 5-AR isoenzyme is present in the skin. In in particular, it is present in the sebaceous glands as well as in the brain where it is involved in neurosteroid synthesis. Unlike the type 2 5-AR isoenzyme, DHT produced by the type 1 5-AR isoenzyme is involved in the genesis of sebaceous gland activity as well as acne, but not in hair loss. So the type 1 5-AR isoenzyme causes yet another misery produced by the trash hormone DHT, but in a different way than the type 2 5-AR isoenzyme. The type 3 5-AR enzyme is found throughout the tissues of the body, and we talk about its role in a minute. Like I said, the other two blue wizard enzymes I mentioned are even less understood than the type 3 isoenzyme, and it's not clear what their role is, and they are probably not even affected by finasteride or dutasteride at all. So we'll just have to put them aside for now. One reason these isoenzymes have been hard to study is that they are hydrophobic, meaning they are unstable in water, so it's hard to test chemical reactions with them in a test tube. The isoenzyme reside in lipid membranes inside the cells. That's one one reason the type 3 isoenzyme was only discovered recently and is still not well understood even today. Because these 5-AR isoenzymes are hard to isolate for a proper study, some of the research into how these drugs affect these enzymes is a little inconsistent. However, we know that finasteride is a pretty specific type 2 blocker, while dutasteride blocks type 1 and type 2. It is about 100 times more powerful as a type 1 blocker than finasteride, and 3 times as powerful a type 2 blocker as finasteride, and this greater suppression of the type 2 5-AR enzyme, along with its longer half-life, is the reason why dutasteride is a more efficacious drug than finasteride at stopping hair loss. These comparisons are based on what's called the IC50 concentrations, and if you want to know more about how they work, you should watch my video on the best topical antiandrogen for hair loss, where I discuss how you can use these IC50 concentrations to compare drugs. I'll go ahead and link that video in the description. So, because finasteride has minimal, if any, effects on the type 1 isoenzyme in humans, it shouldn't have any effect on the synthesis of neurosteroids in the brain, since the isoenzyme 
isoenzyme present in the brain is the type 1 isoenzyme. Theoretically, dutasteride, which is a type 1 blocker, might have some effects on brain neurosteroid levels, but dutasteride is a much bigger molecule than finasteride, and it may not cross what's called the blood-brain barrier very well. Practically speaking, there is no good evidence that either drug has significant effects on depressing brain neurosteroid levels. In fact, a large meta-analysis of over 200,000 subjects on finasteride or dutasteride showed no statistically significant increased risk of depression in subjects taking either of these drugs. So, it's likely that most, if not all, of these so-called neurological side effects are due to a nocebo effect from the rampant online fear-mongering about 5-AR inhibitors where they're accused of doing everything from numbing your anus to changing your sexual orientation or your gender identity. But at this point, you're probably writing in the comments section right now, But Kevin, you said that the type 3 5 ar isoenzyme is everywhere in the body, including the brain and the genitals, and I heard that both finasteride and dutasteride block it, so that's gotta cause side effects, but my Neurosteroids! Well, there's two questions to consider here, Chooms. Number one is, what does the type 3 enzyme actually do in the body? And number two is, do finasteride or dutasteride actually block this enzyme? Well, the first question has a surprising answer. Even though the type 3 enzyme is capable of converting testosterone into the trash hormone DHT, it does so very, very slowly and is less efficient a converter than the type 1 isoenzyme, which is what's shown in this graph here. This is emphasized in this quote from a study that looked at the function of the type 3 isoenzyme in great detail. Notice that frequently in studies on these enzymes, they are named after the genes that produce these enzymes. So the type 1 isoenzyme's gene is SRD5A1, the type 2 is SRD5A2, and the type 3 is SRD5A3. So the study that this quote came from is this study right here. In the study, the investigators identified a large family in Iran that had a mutation in the SRD5A3 gene, meaning their type 3 5 ar enzyme didn't work at all. Although the people affected by this abnormality had a lot of abnormalities, one thing they did not have at all were any sexual development abnormalities. Now, DHT is important for development of sexual organs in children. In fact, in children that lack the type 2 5 ar enzyme, there are very low DHT levels, and male children appear to be females when when they are young, at least until adolescence when the development of the penis does occur as a result of testosterone. So normally DHT is important in the uterus to develop the sex organs in children, but it isn't important for sex organ maturation in adolescence or in adulthood. This isn't just my opinion, this is the opinion of most people in the medical community outside of a few quacks on the PFS network's payroll like Dr. Trash and Dr. Earwig, but children born with mutations in the SRD5A3 gene and have no 5AR type 3 activity don't have any sexual abnormalities whatsoever, which suggests that the type 3 isoenzyme doesn't affect DHT levels and that the prime function of the type 3 isoenzyme has nothing at all to do with DHT. In fact, the investigators found that the 5-AR type 3 isoenzyme has to do with a process called glycosylation. So, of the five supposed 5-AR type enzymes that are known to exist, only the type 1 and 2 have anything to do with sex hormones or neurosteroids, as you can see in this figure right here. Now, it's known that congenital defects in both the type 2 and type 3 5 ar enzymes are associated with birth defects, meaning these enzymes are important for development. We know DHT, which is produced by the type 1 and type 2 isoenzymes, is important for early development, but DHT, on the other hand, is a completely trash hormone during adulthood. It's not clear how important the type 3 enzyme is in adulthood. However, we do know from the study of the type 3 isoenzyme we just mentioned that there are other enzymes besides the type 3 isoenzyme that can take over to do glycosylation if the type 3 isoenzyme is lacking or suppressed. These pathways can help overcome a partial block of this enzyme, which could make up for any effect a drug like finasteride or dutasteride has in blocking the enzyme. It turns out, though, that despite a lot of people online confidently saying that finasteride or dutasteride block the type 3 isoenzyme, it's not at all clear that they even do this. The data is conflicting. For example, this table indicates that finasteride is a stronger blocker of the type 3 isoenzyme enzyme than it is of the type 2 isoenzyme. However, dutasteride is about 100 times stronger than that based on the IC50 values. However, 
Other studies like this one here found that dutasteride was a poor inhibitor of the type 3 isoenzyme, having no effect at low levels and just a small effect at very, very high levels. So it is not even clear if finasteride or dutasteride block the type 3 isoenzyme at all. Like I mentioned, these enzymes are very difficult to study in the lab, and in vitro testing in a test tube doesn't always correspond to what happens in living cells. At the very least, we know with certainty that the type 3 isoenzyme has nothing to do with sex hormones or neurosteroids, so it can't be involved with the side effects finasteride is blamed for, whether they be real side effects or nocebo-driven delusions like brain fog. People like Dr. Trash and Dr. Earwig like to point out that there are still unknowns about the 5-AR isoenzymes, and because of that, we should fear finasteride and dutasteride. Well, first of all, the scientific data that exists on the type 3 5 error isoenzyme isn't anything to be fearful over. The data is in fact reassuring as it shows that the type 3 isoenzyme has nothing to do with either sexual or neurological side effects, and in fact, it isn't linked to any adverse effects whatsoever. Also, keep in mind that both finasteride and dutasteride have been around for a very long time now. They are not brand new drugs or some experimental research chemicals like RU5841. They are FDA approved medications with safety data backed up by hundreds of millions of dollars worth of clinical research involving tens of thousands of subjects, as well as independently conducted follow-up research that only further reinforces the safety and efficacy established by the drugs during their FDA clinical trials. It's only very recently that online trolling and litigation hungry communities like the PFS Network and other groups have pushed the narrative that these drugs cause terrible, irreversible side effects. None of those effects were ever described until just the last 10 or 15 years ago, despite the fact that finasteride has been on the market for 31 years now. It's also pretty interesting that these alleged permanent side effects only seem to occur in young people taking a low dose of 1 mg per day of finasteride for hair loss and almost never seem to occur in older men taking a higher dose of 5 mg daily for benign prostatic hyperplasia and who are at greater risk for sexual and neurological problems than young men are. There is a simple explanation for this discrepancy though, and that is because younger people have had a lot more exposure to the internet where they've been exposed to fear-mongering and misinformation which has caused a pronounced nocebo effect in them. This isn't just some hypothesis of mine. If you don't believe in the nocebo effect, this is a well-documented phenomenon that has been confirmed by scientific research with finasteride use. In fact, a classic study from Italy published in 2007 showed that subjects informed about the possibility of specific sexual side effects before starting finasteride had a much higher incidence of side effects than those who weren't warned about these side effects from finasteride. I talk a lot more about the nocebo effect in my video, and I'll go ahead and link that video below. So if you don't think the nocebo effect is real and that people can't convince themselves they are having side effects that are not real, then let's just take a look at all the fake looking videos online of people supposedly shaking from getting a vaccine injection. What a bunch of fucking twats. These people posting these videos are obviously acting in bad faith, and they're all terrible actors. Just as a side note, it is no coincidence that almost everyone who is anti-finasteride or promotes post-finasteride syndrome pseudoscience is also an anti-vaxxer. The fact is, there is a huge overlap with finasteride hate and other conspiracy theories, which is why communities where you see the most incel rage against finasteride are online communities that also promote other conspiracy theories like moon landing denialism, 9-11 truthism, cholesterol denialism, lizard people, and Jewish space lasers. So if you actually take a step back and look at the people in the groups who promote anti-finasteride conspiracy theories, it is easy to see that they are all complete clowns, which is why post-finasteride syndrome is not taken seriously by the scientific or medical community. Even decades after this drug has been released, there has been study after study after study from independent organizations with no conflict of interest, then they all reach the same conclusion over and over again, which is that finasteride is safe and effective, and that post finasteride syndrome doesn't exist. The groups that do have a conflict of interest, like the PFS Network and PFS Foundation, have funded dozens of studies to promote their litigious agenda, and in all that time, all they had to do to confirm the existence of post-finasteride syndrome was conduct a well-designed, randomized, placebo-controlled study, yet this has never happened, because deep down, even they know that post-finasteride syndrome is bullshit. This is just a classic example of the sunk ship fallacy, where they've invested too much of their time and emotion into the sinking ship, and at this point, they'd probably rather die than admit they're wrong. So, anyways, I hope this video has helped put into perspective the role of the different 5-air isoenzymes, in particular, the type 3 isoenzyme, which people always have a lot of questions about. Of course, there's always more to learn and there's more to teach, so I'll be back with more content soon. So, until next time, Chooms, God bless.